start of 1848, San Francisco was a sleepy port town on the California coast with a population of 1,000. On January 24th, 1848, gold was discovered in Coloma, California, kicking off the gold rush. By December 1849, there were 25,000 people in San Francisco. These people came from all over the United States and all over the world. When California became a state the following year, San Francisco was already an exploding metropolis with a bewildering array of races and nationalities. By 1870, for example, 8% of the city's population was Asian, more than any other American city. Wells Fargo Bank was founded in 1852 and the Bank of California in 1864. The Bay Area was a center of trade, connected to Pacific markets through the Port of San Francisco and the U.S. interior through the newly completed Pacific Railroad. By 1890, San Francisco's diverse population approached 300,000, making it the eighth largest city in the United States at that time. This story of San Francisco's spectacular rise captures many of the problems and paradoxes that people face when forging a transcontinental nation between the end of Reconstruction and the turn of the century. Powered by both global markets and unprecedented global migration, the expansion of the American West strengthened the federal state, generated fantastic economic opportunities for some, and unleashed political, ethnic, and racial tensions across the rapidly disappearing frontier. In the conquest of the West, modern Americans face serious questions about industrialization and independence, and the conflict between labor and capital, and perhaps most critically, how the relationship between Indians, immigrants, and white settlers altered conceptions about American identity. The, this process of forging a modern nation-state, the United States of America, simultaneously meant absorption, rejection, and the destruction of other nations. In 1890, the United States Census indicated that the western frontier was officially closed, an announcement that the young historian Frederick Jackson Turner took as a dire prediction that everything which defined Americans, rugged individualism, pragmatism, democracy, freedom, all according to Turner forged in the western frontier, might now disappear into history. Now Turner may have been overreacting. In the 1890s, there, was a gr there were great areas of open space in the West, and significant sections that were being cleared of their original ha inhabitants. Between 1877 and 1900, millions of people from all over the world and every region of the United States poured into that vacuum. And with them came the tremendous forces of industrialization, urbanization, and cosmopolitanism. By 1890, most Western migrants had settled in cities like Denver, with a population of 133,000, San Francisco, population of 380,000, Los Angeles, with a population of 124,000, and Salt Lake City, with a modest 53,000 people, as well as countless towns throughout the land. Despite popular perception, the West was the most urban region in America in the 1890s, but these were new cities instant cities that grew rapidly from tiny outposts to booming metropolitan areas in less than a decade under the twin pressures of an economic expansion and changing migration patterns following the Civil War. Beginning during Reconstruction, foreign and internal migration patterns changed for a number of reasons. But the one key was most certainly the development of the transcontinental railroad system. On May 10th, 1869, a gold spike was hammered into the rails in Promontory, Utah, signaling the completion of the first transcontinental railroad. The railroads made foreign and internal movement of peoples much easier. They promoted economic and geographical expansion, and significantly, as the name implies, the transcontinental railroad represented a national project designed to advance the federal interests of the United States of America. Economic recessions, environmental catastrophes, and new immigration that lowered wages and raised prejudice in eastern cities all pushed migrants into the West. In 1877, tens of thousands of African-American exodusters 
fleeing racial violence at the end of the military reconstruction, moved from the South into the West, becoming part of the expanding and diverse nation. Women, too, contributed a disproportionate amount of daily labor to establish businesses, homes, towns, and communities in the West. They became founders of these settler societies, along with Native Americans, freed slaves, and Hispanics of many origins, as well as Asians and Euro-Americans. Before the Great White Migration kicked in with earnest after the Civil War, Indian tribes made up the largest and most important population group in the West. Some were from Eastern nations, forcibly resettled west of the Mississippi, but most were members of indigenous nations whose roots stretched back for eons. They included the Serrano, Chumash, Pomo, and Chinook along the Pacific coast, who had survived the arrival of the Spanish. But the most widespread Indian groups in the West were the Plains Indians, spread out across the vast central and western parts of North America. They included farmers, horsemen, hunters, and gatherers. The buffalo, or bison, provided the economic basis for the Plains Indians' entire way of life. Flesh for food, skins for clothing, dried manure for fuel, bones for knives and arrow tips, tendons to make strings for bows. The Plains Indians and the buffalo existed in a symbiotic relationship with each other, which would be profoundly altered by the intrusion of the railroads. Tracks also connected the east and west coast to the southwest, parts of the United States that have for centuries been a part of the Spanish Empire and later the Mexican Republic. In New Mexico, the centers of Spanish-speaking society were farming and trading communities established in the 17th century. The Mexican-American War in 1845 to 1848 brought this territory into U.S. possession and was followed by a period in which the American military subdued the power of the Navajo, Apache, and other tribes in the area. Once the railroads penetrated the region in the 1880s and 1890s, the Anglo-American presence grew rapidly. At the same time as Europeans were crossing the Atlantic in search of opportunity, many Chinese were crossing the Pacific for the same reasons. These Chinese, some coming as coolies, that is indentured servants living very close to slavery, moved to Hawaii, Australia, Latin and South America, and to the United States. After the gold rush in 1848, that stream increased dramatically, and by 1880, more than 200,000 Chinese had settled in the United States, first as gold prospectors, and later, as, and later, after discriminatory laws drove them out of the mines, as unskilled laborers. Beginning in 1865, over 12,000 Chinese found work building the Transcontinental Railroad, forming 90% of the labor force of the Central Pacific Railway. The pay was low, and the work on the Central Pacific was arduous and dangerous. The Chinese faced harsh, harsh discrimination, especially once the railroad was completed in 1869, and they sought other work in the now hugely crowded western cities, like San Francisco. Cheap Chinese labor was one side of the economic dynamic of the exploding railroad industry. At the other end were the owners the industrialists and financiers who became fantastically wealthy from the transcontinental economy. In 1860, there were 30,000 miles of railroad trackage. By 1900, it had expanded to 193,000, and with that, fortunes expanded fantastically for a very few. America's first tycoons, like Jay Gould, Cornelius Vanderbilt, and Andrew Carnegie, made incredible amounts of money. In the 1870s, Gould's Pennsylvania Railroad was the largest private enterprise in the world, worth $400 million and employing 55,000 people. Railroads were central in transforming the United States into an industrial nation driven by corporate and finance capitalism. Regional rail development in the 1880s and 1890s used 25% of U.S. annual timber production and spawned the massive or bonanza wheat farms of the Dakotas and the fruit and vegetable economies of Arizona and California. Western coal mining 
grew from regional rail demands for cheaper energy. The opening of a national commodities market in the West was both a blessing and a curse, depending on where you stood. New industries and outlets opened and expanded, but farm, small farmers suffered with the arrival of large-scale corporate agriculture. But this incredible expansion was not solely the work of private enterprise. The creation of a transcontinental continental nation was a partnership between corporate capital and investment and government policy. Subsidies from federal, state, and local governments were, used, were vital to westward expansion and to the very construction of the railway system. The federal government alone doled out massive land grants to the railroad companies as well as $64 million in tax incentives and direct aid. Combined federal and state land grants to the railroad industry amounted to more than 180 million acres, larger than the size of Texas. The Transcontinental Railroad also depended for its success on the state's work in clearing, mapping, and conquering the western lands. Since the Lewis and Clark expedition, at the start of the century, the federal government had been in the, at the forefront of westward expansion, surveying territories, forging trails and roads, establishing lines of communication. In 1879, the U.S. Congress consolidated various survey programs into the United States Geological Survey, or USGS, which charted, scientifically categorized, photographed, and named the western lands, overlaying maps with grids to facilitate development. The West, in this respect, is best understood as a federal frontier, opened up for American settlement by government policies like the Homestead Act of 1862 and the Desert Lands Act of 1877, which provided nearly free land to migrants willing to develop it. Westward expansion was driven as much by state-sponsored initiatives like this as it was by individual ambitions and quests for economic opportunities homesteading and railroad construction were simultaneously about private enrichment and nation building. And critically, the state facilitated expansion through conquest. Much of the West was, quote, won by force. The U.S. Army, as well as state and local militias, quelled Native American resistance, labor uprisings, and riots. The building of a transcontinental nation was contingent on clearing the western lands of much older existing nations in the Great Plains and along the Pacific Coast. As your textbook American Promise suggests, the United States' impressive railroad system was built on the, quote, military conquest of America's inland empire. After the Civil War, promoters of expansion, or boosters as they were called, made grand and often overly romanticized claims about life in the West. Through widely circulated letters, advertisements, memoirs, and fictionalized accounts, emerged a vision of pioneer societies and the frontier process that was such a compelling mythology that even savvy observers had difficulty discerning fact from fiction. No single person blended reality and myth more successfully than William Buffalo Bill Cody. A legend in his own time, he was at once a real person and a fictional character of international fame. By the 1880s, Cody's circus-like Wild West shows were touring the nation and the world, recreating a romantic, nostalgic, and kitschy version of frontier life. Attractions included real Indians, recreations of famous Western lore, gunslinging, sharpshooting, and so on. Much of the image of the West that was to endure for decades in popular imagination was shaped in Buffalo Bill shows. The Wild West, as popularized by Cody, was heavily sanitized and mythologized, particularly in its downplay of the violence and brutality that characterized the American conquest of the Inland Empire. Continental Empire building between 1877 and 1900 was more than the adventures of imagined cowboy heroes in a final act for the Wild West shows. Settlers, migrants, and money men, encouraged by the government, moved into the American West to seize opportunities in this virgin land. 
but this was not virgin land, and it wasn't empty. From the Canadian border in the north to Mexico in the south, what settlers called the Wild West were extensive regions of Indian lands that stood right in the path of national, corporate, and individual ambitions after the Civil War. By 1877, pioneer trails, settlements, and the transcontinental highway had broken through fragile tribal, tribal borders. Continental expansion was not just nation building, it was also a process of dismantling nations. In the 1880s and 1890s, with settlers in search of gold and railroad fortunes putting increasing pressure on the West, military action and federal legislation combined with economic and cultural forces to erase established Indian territorial lines and drastically reduce the amount of Indian controlled land. Traditionally, the policy of the federal government was to regard the tribes simultaneously as independent nations with whom treaties could be negotiated and as wards of the president who exercised a paternalistic authority over them. As late as 1860, the concept of tribal sovereignty had supported attempts to erect a more or less permanent frontier between whites and Indians. This idea of separating American and Native American societies had animated both the early 19th century policy of Indian removal, as, which means forcibly relocating tribes further and further west to clear land for white settlement, and the reservation system instituted in 1851 through which each tribe was assigned its own limited and concentrated territory. This policy of concentration did not survive as the sole basis for, of Indian policy for, for very long. In 1867, Congress established the Indian Peace Commission to recommend a new permanent Indian policy, what came to be known as the Peace Policy. The landmark Indian Appropriations Act of 1869 authorized the President, at the time Ulysses S. Grant, to quote, exercise joint control with the Secretary of the Interior, unquote, over Indian appropriations. Grant sponsored the peace policy, but the goal of peace was quickly swamped by competing ambitions. Indian commissioners and leaders of various Christian denominations provided food, Indians with food and clothing in exchange for promises to abandon cultural traditions and to assimilate into American society. Indians were pushed, often under direct military threat, to move into smaller and smaller re reservations on land considered useless for white settlement or industry. By the 1880s, the U.S. government acknowledged that the only Indian territory left was on rapidly dwindling reservations. In 1887, Congress moved to reverse its nearly 50-year policy of concentration and, ab and abolish the practice by which tribes own their own lands communally. The Dawes Severalty Act, or simply the Dawes Act, ordered the gradual elimination of most tribal ownership of land and, al and the allotment of tracts to individual owners. Adults were to be granted American citizenship, but unlike other citizens, they could not gain full title to their property for 25 years. The goal of the allotment policy was to push Indians to become independent landowners and farmers, to abandon their collective society and culture, and to become part of white civilization. The policy was assimilation. Some supporters of the new policy seemed to believe that they were acting for the good of the Indians, whom they considered a, quote, vanishing race in need of rescue by white society. How did Indian groups respond to these policies? The reactions of Indians were, were as diverse and complex as the multiple Indian nations themselves. Few Indians were ready for or interested in this wrenching cultural change being demanded of them, but the varying, varying programs for, for assimilation into American culture were pressed relentlessly by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and, often by force, many Indian families and children attempted to become part of white society. Perhaps no official policy was more controversial than Indian education. It was a fairly simple premise. Take children away from their ignorant parents and their backward communities and train them to be Americans who cherish individualism and republicanism over tribal life and Christianity over their religious traditions. Reformers called for a, quote, army of Christian school teachers, unquote, to lead children, Indian children from barbarism towards civilization and salvation. 
founded in 1879 by Richard Henry Pratt with federally appropriated funds, the Carlisle Indian Training School opened with 84 Lakota children who became its first students. Their education there marked the beginning of a generation-long effort to assimilate Indian children coercively in 81 schools from Carlisle to Riverside, California. The stated goal of the program was to kill the Indian in him and save the man. The story of Indian education is complicated. Students sometimes went willingly to the boarding schools for personal reasons or to escape the humiliation of the reservations. Some parents voluntarily turned their children over in hopes for a better life for them. Others were sent or taken through coercion. Separation from parents was considered the f first necessary step to isolate Indians from their culture. At the schools, teachers gave the children new anglicized names and new European style clothes. The setting and curriculum were designed to teach Indian children to conform to the ways of the white world. By 1900, the U.S. government had spent almost three million dollars on the schools. Enrollments had increased from 3,500 to over 21,000, or 50 percent of school-age Indian children. Despite these numbers, however, the assimilation through education experiment failed to destroy Indian culture. Some emerged with a renewed sense of collective Indian identity that became the seed of a united Indian civil rights movement. Others, who were said to be, quote, too white to be red, too red to be white, left the school with no real cultural identity and a more difficult chance for success in either world. For other Indian nations, the response to American empire building was not assimilation, but fierce resistance. Whites and Indians fought incessantly from the 1850s to the 1880s, as Indians struggled against the growing threats to their civilization. Indian warriors attacked wagon trains, stagecoaches, and isolated ranches, often in retaliation for white attacks on them. As the U.S. Army became more involved in the fighting, the Indian tribes began focusing strategy on attacking white soldiers. This period in history, in the history of Indian-white relations, has been termed the Indian Wars and is viewed by many historians as the last, last great resistance through force of Native Americans to the United States nation-building project. The term is appropriate, as these were, by every measure, battles between nations. During the Civil War, the Eastern Sioux in Minnesota squeezed into a small reservation and exploited by white agents suddenly rebelled. Led by Little Crow, they killed more than 700 whites before being subdued. At the same time, fighting exploded in eastern Colorado, where the Arapaho and Cheyenne clashed with white miners settling in the region. As the Indian attacks mounted, whites called up a huge militia. A band of Indians under the leadership of Black Kettle were lured by the U.S. governor of the territory into a camp with promises of protection and negotiation. They were then set upon by a militia of unemployed and possibly drunk miners who massacred 133 people, most of them women and children, in the camp. Black Kettle escaped, but in 1868, he and Cheyenne warriors went to war with whites near the Texas border, where they were caught and killed by white troops under the command of General George A. Custer. After the Civil War, struggle flared all over the frontier, with official U.S. military joined by bands of white vigilantes who engage in what became known as Indian hunting. In contrast to the assimilationist reformers that spearheaded Indian education, considerable numbers of whites were committed to the literal elimination of the tribes, a goal that rested on the belief in the essential inhumanity of Indians and the impossibility of coexistence. In California, civilians killed close to 5,000 Indians between 1850 and 1880, and combined with disease and poverty, this reduced the Indian population in the state from 150,000 before the Civil War to 30,000 in 1870. These genocidal actions were accompanied by the relentless slaughter of buffalo herds by whites that decimated the tribe's entire way of life. After the Civil War, professional, professional and amateur hunters, even casual visitors shooting from passing trains, swarmed all over the plains, killed, killing the animals in huge numbers. For buffalo hunting Indians, the true crisis came in the 1860s and 1870s, when the Transcontinental Railroad enabled mass hunting 
and, interna in, and the international hide trade. Mechanized industries use leather hides for machine belts. The results were catastrophic. In 1865, there had been upwards of 15 million buffalo in the United States. A decade later, fewer than 1,000 of them were left. The consequences for the Plains Indians was starvation and the collapse of their economy and way of life. By destroying the buffalo herds, whites were destroying the Indian source of food and supplies and their ability to resist white advance. This was an existential conflict, and it should come as no surprise that Indians resisted their annihilation. After a brief lull in the late 1860s and early 1870s, the Indian wars flared anew in the northern plains, where the Sioux rose up in 1875 and left their reservation. When white officials ordered them to return, bands of warriors gathered in Montana and united under two great leaders, Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull. Three army columns set out to round them up and force them back to, into the reservation. With this expedition was General Custer. At the Battle of Little Bighorn in southern Man Montana in 1876, an unprecedentedly, unprecedentedly large army of perhaps 2,500 tribal warriors surprised Custer and part of his regiment, surrounded them, and killed every single soldier. But the Indians did not have the supplies or broad Indian manpower to stay united. As they dispersed in search of food, the army ran them down and returned them to the reservation. Thereafter, the power of the Sioux dwindled and they accepted defeat. As a side note, the defeat of Custer and his troopers was popu a popularized episode in the history of Western Indian warfare and was fostered by an advertising campaign by the Anheuser-Busch Brewing Company. The enterprising company ordered reprints of a dramatic painting that depicted, quote, Custer's last fight and had them framed and hung in many American saloons, helping to create the lasting impressions of the battle and the brewery's products in the minds of bar patrons. One of the most dramatic episodes in Indian history occurred in Idaho in 1877. The Nez Perce were a small, relatively peaceful tribe some of whose members had managed to live until the 1870s in Oregon without ever signing a single treaty with the United States. But under pressure from white settlers, the U.S. government forced them to move onto a reservation. On the way, several younger Indians, drunk and angry, killed four white settlers. The leader of the band uh, in Muttu Yalatlat, or Chief Joseph, as he was known, persuaded his followers to flee from the inve inevitable retribution. American troops pursued them and attacked them, after which the Nez Perce scattered and became part of a remarkable chase. Joseph moved with 200 warriors and 350 men, women, children, and old people in an effort to reach Canada. Pursued by four columns of American soldiers, the Nez Perce covered uh, 1,321 miles in 75 days, repelling or evading the army time and time again. They were finally caught just short of the Canadian border. Some of them escaped across, but Joseph and his, most of his followers, weary and discouraged, gave up. After a meeting with an American general, Joseph is, reported, is recorded to have said, Hear me, my chiefs. I am tired. My heart is sick and sad. From where the sun now stands, I will fight no more, forever. One final response to the dismantling of their nations was a broad religious revival movement called the Ghost Dance. As many other tribes had done in times of despair, the Sioux returned to a shaman to show them the way forward. This time the prophet was Wavoka, a Paiute who inspired a fervent spiritual awakening that started in Nevada and spread quickly to the plains. Blending Indian traditions with elements from Christianity, Wavoka predicted the imminent coming of the Messiah. The new revival's most conspicuous feature was a mass emotional dance called the Ghost Dance, which inspired ecstatic mystical visions, including images of the disappearance of white people from the plains and their replacement with the great buffalo herds. The number of Ghost Dancers was small, but they, cr but they crossed tribal lines, and enough participated to raise concerns with the Office of Indian Affairs that the dances might be a prelude to hostilities. The federal government outlawed the religion in 1890 and strengthened military presence on the Northern Plains. <laughs>
On December 15, 1890, soldiers killed Sitting Bull during a raid on his Standing Rock cabin. Troops with the U.S. 7th Cal Cavalry then followed uh, the, uh, a tribe of ghost dancers and their leader, Bigfoot, <clears throat> to Wounded Knee, South Dakota, where they met up with Chiefs uh, Short Bull and Kicking Bear. On the morning of December 28th, soldiers surrounded the dancers. After a brief confrontation with a medicine man named Yellowbird, a shot rang out, and the soldiers, opening fire with light artillery, killed between 150 and 300 Indian men, women, and children. The history of tribal dismantling, essential to understanding the building of the United States, is almost entirely missing from the romantic lore of the Wild West and the cartoonish antics of the Buffalo Bill Show. It is the tragic and genocidal side of the story that clashes with the celebration of national American greatness.